Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome back to the Teamwork Advantage. I am Greg Gregory, your host for the day, and we're joined today by Mary Kelly. Uh, Dr. Kelly is going to help us go through some concepts on leadership, teamwork, and of course, the organizational culture. If this is your first time joining us, that is our primary focus on the Teamwork Advantage. We help organizations build teams from within, develop leadership that know how to do it, and create the culture that is so powerful to make people, organizations, as even all the way down to the small teams, successful. So today, I just want to share a little bit about Mary Kelly. And I want to sh- I've got a couple of pages I could read here, but I'm not going to go into all of that, Mary. But I do want to bring up a couple of points. Um, she's a graduate of the United States Naval Academy. She spent 20 years on active duty in intelligence and logistics. She's retired from the Navy as a commander. She also has a master's degree in economics, along with a PhD in economics. If you go a little further down the line, she's also been in human resources and developed a business model for the computer and telecommunications organization for personnel hiring, training, and retention that was adopted globally by the United States Navy. That's powerful when you start to look at that. As an educator, Dr. Kelly has uh, created a mandatory curriculum for a college student body of over 4,500 students. Just absolutely powerful when you start to look at that. Some of the backgrounds, just some bullet points. Again, a Naval Academy graduate, PhD in economics. She's trained over 40,000 military and civilian in multicultural environments, a Naval Intelligence Officer, Human Resources Director, Assistant Chief of Staff, Chief of Police, taught at the Naval Academy and the United States Air Force Academy, as well as, of course, Hawaii Pacific University. Mary Kelly, welcome to the Team Work Advantage. Greg, I'm so excited to be here today and to share just a few ideas with your audience that might be helpful for them, especially as we are in such difficult times. And difficult times is just a beginning of it because I think it's a very Well, it's the first time we've been through a lot of what we're going through, whether it's the COVID virus and working from home and changing the way we're doing things. So it's kind of interesting when we get into understanding all of that. And with that in mind, my first question, simple, is what do we need to know as leaders today and how is it changing because of the way things are changing and so fluid? Greg, thanks for getting right to the heart of what's going on, because right now many leaders are succumbing to some of the feelings, the emotions, the self-doubt, and the myopic viewpoint that prevents them from being good leaders. So first off, our leaders have to get their head back in the game. Yes, when this whole virus thing started happening and then other world events started to uh, compound the issues of this virus crisis that is the global pandemic, we were all in the first few stages of crisis response. Now, there's actually six stages of crisis response. And I'm going to send you a link where your audience can get some of the materials I've developed on this totally free, totally um, open to them. Great. But there's these six stages. And the first, of course, is the rejection stage. And that was, that's where I was back in February. I was like, oh, come on. It's just like the bad flu. It's not really going to be a problem for me. Well, apparently it kind of is. And then we get into the beginning part of the recognition phase. Okay. I recognize this is an issue. I have to make a few small changes. Maybe I have to work from home for a couple of weeks. Maybe the kids are going to be out of school for a little while. Not a problem. That's okay. Recognition. And then the realization phase kicks in. And the realization phase is, oh gosh, this is going to be more than what I thought. Lots of things are going to change. I have to adapt. I have to be a better leader. I have to be a better manager. I've got to be a better person for my family. Maybe I've got to get new technology to work from home. I've got to have my people better equipped. This, re- this realization phase kicks in. And then you get into the resolution phase because you're a leader. That's okay. We can do this. We're in it together. We can support each other. Those four phases. Now, Those four phases overlap. And so you go rejection, recognition, realization, and then this resolution phase. Well, for many people, they stay mired in those four, those four cycles. And in fact, you can go from one, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, four, three, all in about five seconds. Back and forth. Right. And this is where most people stay. 
it's very much a circle the wagons, protect yourself. This is why you saw the buying of the toilet paper. And by the way, Greg, I told people I wasn't worried about empty toilet paper shelves. I was going to get worried when there were empty wine shelves. Well, you've heard about the quarantine wine festivals and the quarantinis and all of that. So, yes. Well, and the, I know that you're very close to Pennsylvania out there in Maryland. And so I have to tell you that our governor thought for a moment about mimicking what Pennsylvania's governor did, and that's to shut down all the liquor stores. And by the way, uh, the neighboring states' liquor stores have never been happier, just so you know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All that state revenue, where did it go? Maryland, uh, New York, um, West Virginia. And so, yay, Ohio, good job, yeah. Governor. So our Colorado governor on the 23rd of March thought that he was going to do the same thing. So at four o'clock in a news conference, he announced that he was going to close down the liquor stores the next day. So this was at four o'clock. I was in my car at 407. I pulled up to my local liquor store where they know me by name. I don't park in the front parking lot. I pull up in the back and I was like, load it up, boys. This is what we're going to do. I also have a storeroom that is conveniently about four blocks away from the liquor store because I thought, Greg, well, maybe I can't go out and talk at conferences and be a speaker, but I'm going to open a speakeasy. That works for me. Right? So I that bought the works. bitters everything i've got this put together so anyway this this is why people get into those four stages and then they tend to stay there very myopically again the rejection the, the recognition the realization and then the resolution and many leaders go okay i'll stay positive i'll stay positive and but that's as far as they get where leaders need to be are in the last two cycles and those are the two cycles that need to overlay on top of each other and that's where our leaders need to be and that is the reality phase and the realignment phase. And the reality is, this is the new reality. If you're nostalgic for 2019, then guess what? It's just gonna be a miserable rest of your life because we're never gonna go back to the way things were in 2019. So being nostalgic for something that's never gonna come back, that's, that's again, very myopic victim mentality mm -hmm. thinking. It's just not gonna be there. So we can joke recognize. about it and have fun about it and explain it, but we yes. can't live it. We can't live it, no. And we know on the plus side, so this is when I try to get my people into that next phase. I say, so right off the top of your head, give me 10 reasons why this whole virus crisis has made things better. And all of a sudden there's this pause. I go, no, 10 things, ready, set, go. And there's silence. I'm like, come on people, you can do this. Mm -hmm. So right away, you're like, wait a second, restaurants are way cleaner, hospitals. Guess what? Infections are down in hospitals because Hospitals have been begging for PPE gear for years, and now all of a sudden we have to do it. That hospital staffs feel safer going to work now because of all the precautions that they wanted to take before, but they couldn't, they didn't have the gear. Um, infections like MRSA in hospitals have gone down. So these are good changes, things are cleaner. And you and I travel a lot in our normal capacities. Yep. Guess what, our hotel rooms are gonna be cleaner. Uh, we don't have to worry about housekeeping using the same brush on the toilet as in the glasses anymore. You know, I mean, so this is kind of good. These, there's a lot of changes and that's just in the cleanliness side. On the other side, we have now figured out that professional people can be trusted to work when they're not at work. Shocking idea. Yes. The professionals behave like professionals? Crazy. Because before this, six months ago, my leaders would say things like, well, how do I know they're working if they're not at work? And I'm like, look, I've been to your workplace. I walk around. They're at work. They're not working. Right. You're not going to, this isn't a magical switch that happens when they walk in the door. And for many people, they are wildly more productive at home mm -hmm. because now they're not tired. They're getting, maybe they got a couple hours a day, especially where you are. If you're not driving into DC or Baltimore every day, that's hours of your life back. You're yeah. now better rested. You're better focused. Your family is happier. Your dogs are happier. My dogs are happier. This is fantastic. And we're able to merge our professional and our personal lives in a way that actually works. Like, so one of the challenges I can encourage your leaders and your listeners with is make a list of 10 things of why this is better. Why where we are is better than where we were six months ago. And again, it gets you out of that very myopic thinking. And this is part of the new reality. Everything in the new reality is on the table. Every detail, every process, and these are my buckets of opportunity. People, processes, technology, resources, training. These are all buckets right. of, entre uh, of opportunity. So look at those things in a way that is an opportunity, not a, oh, woe is me, oh, isn't this terrible, oh, change is bad, no. 
this is the new reality. So for example, Greg, the last time you went to go buy a new car, they probably said, okay, you can get this car in black, white, gray, red, maybe blue. You're like, okay, and you can get a sunroof, maybe some leather seats, maybe an enhanced stereo. Those were your choices. Because in the short run, you only have a few choices, but in the long run, everything is on the table. table. Yep. And that's what we're looking at now. Everything is on the table, including whether or not the car or the truck even runs on gas. Mm -hmm. So everything in the long run is now being looked at. And that leads us into the, the, the sixth level, and that's realignment. So the realignment phase is question everything. How am I better serving my customers? What do they need from me? What can I supply even before they know they need something? How can I better meet the needs of my clients, my customers, and my suppliers in a way nobody else is serving them? How do I better serve my employees? I'm probably gonna have fewer of them moving into the future because we've learned mm, humans were gross. We carry around viruses and bacteria and gross things, gross things. Robots, mm, maybe an idea. So we're going to see more automation. We're going to see more technology, but somebody's got to make that technology work and they don't have to be in your own home. So the Twitter CEO came out and Jack Dempsey, Dorsey, Jack, Jack, um, came out and said, Hey, if you're working for Twitter and you don't want to go back to work, you don't have to. Right. And this is going to fundamentally shift how we do things. The danger there is, wait a second, you were working in Midtown Manhattan and we were paying you a premium because you were working in Midtown Manhattan. Well, now you're staying home, which means we can hire somebody from Bangladesh to do your job too. So here's the thing. This is making us more globally focused for our labor, even though we're more locally sourced for certain products right. that are hand deliverables. It's mm -hmm. a very interesting dynamic. Those are the first, th that's the first big issues I wanted to talk to you about were these six cycles and how leaders need to be in the new reality and the new realignment. Well, if we look at it, though, go back to Google, even six years ago, they were already in part of this. Google at that time, they, they didn't care whether you came to work or not. They didn't care what time of the day you worked or whatever. They mm -hmm. only cared that the product and what you were doing was getting done. And that, correct. That's, that's key. And so today we're starting to see that. There was a story that I saw in the last day or so in the news that was talking about the percentage of people who think they're more productive. And I was surprised it was not quite as it was where it was. I thought it would have been higher. Mm -hmm. but they're talking about the people that are more productive at work. And my philosophy mm -hmm. has always been, if you're a productive in the office, you will be equally productive at home. If you're a lousy worker at work, you're going to be a lousy teleworker. That's exactly and that right. comes back down to the key thing of leadership. Comes down to leadership, accountability, and making sure that your people understand your mission, your vision, and your goals moving forward. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit. We talked a little bit before we got on to the um, recording here. There's a power part in there about mission, vision, values, and how they come into play. Because if we don't have those values in place, if we're not focused on those values and we're not delivering them, then trying to get everybody on there, we've got people going maybe towards the same goal, but getting to it differently. And that, that can be a challenge. You want to share, share your thoughts there? I would love to. And thanks for that. That your vision is where you're going. Your vision mm -hmm. needs to be so clear, so compelling and exciting. It needs to be exciting for people who say, oh gosh, I get to work with Greg Gregory because he's going here. This is where he is. This is fantastic. If you can get on his podcast, he's amazing. That's what you want. That's your vision. So your mission is what it is you do. My company's, our company's mission is we improve profit growth. That's what we do. We're very clear on that. We want to be the premier. Our vision is we want to be the premier economic and leadership development choice for companies that are in our market target. So right. that's fantastic for us. But our goals and how to get there are, we're going to do these things every day, every week, every month with consistency. Now, it doesn't mean they're the same things. How we approach things are different, which is why the values are crystal clear. Every single person on my team knows that we have, well, they can fire a client. If a client is mean or rude, or they say something that is so wildly out of whack with our values that any one of the team can say, I don't think this is a good fit for us. And we don't do it. And because that's so powerful. 
it's really powerful and they know we mean it. And there was one, there was one particular person who was really, really difficult on the call. And I thought, oh, this could maybe be bad because we want to work with people who share our ideals. So as you know, my, uh, one of my early books has a dog on the cover of it. And somebody said, but some people don't like dogs. And I said, that's fine. They're never going to work with us. We're fine with that. We use dog analogies. We like animals. And if they hate dogs, we're probably never going to be aligned. And now I'm not saying that they're bad people. It's just not going to be the best it's just different. for us. It's different. Yes. So we're never going to, we're never going to have that sync that my, my dog, my horse and my wine lovers and I are all going to have together or pick one out of three. I mean, we're never going to, we, we want to work with people who get us and who like our values for who we are. We have, we stand for a certain type of client. And it's really great to understand what your core values are and what that means and how that translates into what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, um, right now, people talk about uh, diversity of thought and diversity of all these things, it's a very big topic right now. So what I tell my business people is you have to love everyone love everyone and get different people's different perspectives all the time. Because if you've got a team of 10 people who all think the same, then guess what? Nine of them, you don't need, they're redundant. What you need are different ideals. In my company, I have people from ages 18 to 85 because I need a cross section of things. Not only that, but I have people um, who work for me in uh, companies such as Bangladesh, as um, uh, Pakistan, as India, as Sri Lanka, because I need to make sure I'm getting a better global perspective than just my own global perspective. I need that. But they share our values. And our values are things like, we serve people. We love people. We love serving people. We love serving people who love people and who love serving people. Those are our values. And it gets us excited mm -hmm. when we can help those people grow their business, grow their practice, grow their hospital, grow whatever it is they want to do. It excites us. So having that shared sense of value that excites the rest of the team, I'm not, I'm not saying everybody has to think alike, look alike, talk alike, or anything like that. That is not what I'm saying. Yeah. And many people make that mistake. And we were talking before the call, um, you're very close to my alma mater right there in Annapolis. And I say this all the time. I'm like, you know what? It's very easy for a Navy person to hire another Navy person because we know we can speak the same language. Uh, we understand our acronyms. We do all those things. But that doesn't really help you grow your business. It might be a comfortable thing, but it doesn't help you grow your business in a way that stretches you and pushes you. And this, Greg, is where I love what's happening right now in terms of 2020, because it is forcing acceleration of those opportunities, of the people, the process, right. the technologies. It is forcing people out of their comfort zone and into a place of, of uncomfortable, of chaos and change, which is going to make us more innovative. And they're having to pivot. And that, that's key. Uh, I recently listened to uh, General Stanley McChrystal talking about his situation in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And when he first got there, how everything was done the old fashioned way. Now I know he's an advocate in one way, both military and he is a West Point grad. I know that. He is. Yeah. But he, he also talked about having to change. And if he wasn't open to being able to change as the leader, it wasn't going to work. That's exactly right. And this is, as you know, I work as, a lot as a corporate advisor. I'm not like, I'm not like a, just a coach or a consultant because I go in and I've, I go, well, what about that? What about that? What about that? And we have to look very holistically at the large, at the organization, because if one division, one department isn't willing to go along with everything else, and they're not willing to change, then it's going to hamper the profitability for everybody. And you're absolutely right. This is a leadership issue because there's they're so comfortable with what got them here. Let's face it, we're on a 10-year economic roll. If you couldn't make money in the last 10 years, guess what? You need to not be in business for yourself. Um, you really need to go out and get a job um, working for somebody else. Because if you can't do well in the best 10 years of economic growth we've seen, then you've got major problems. And here's, the, here's what worries me, is that even moving into this, we still had only about 25% of companies having more cash than debt. That's a big concern. And those are the companies right now that are really, really struggling. But it also made a lot of our leaders a mm, little bit lazy. I'll say it, lazy. We're complacent because we could be, because we're making money, we were doing well, we had good, 
we had not as great as we could have had, but we had really good profits. We were doing okay. We were doing okay. But now all of a sudden, this whole crisis has taken a big spotlight and put it right on our business. And now we can see the cracks. Yeah. The great thing about this is every single crack is an opportunity to fix it and be better. Yeah, it's it's so powerful. And going back with your background in economics, it's it's grasping an avenue that a lot of folks just don't get. And that is, you know, we've got you've got to have the stability there and you've got to be able to grow it, but you've also got to be able to make sure that you're not gonna let it fall apart either. That's right. And, and I remember uh one economics course in college that I had, and uh, he simply said, he said, We'll talk about a lot about it when it comes to economics, but everything boils down to supply and demand. Mm -hmm. And it was rather interesting to hear him bring that point out because when you look at it, that's what's happening. So leaders are more concerned with the health of their companies today, I think. And when I say health, it's not necessarily the financial health that they, they get used to and they, they build on that. But there's so many of them that are worried about the internal health of their people. And again, mm -hmm. not the health of the people from a medical point of view, but the health of how well they're getting along, how well their culture is and how they're building. And mm -hmm. that's what's keeping them awake. And so how do we, how do leaders start to pull all of that together, both the economic side, the physical side, all of that together and blend it? That's, that's the challenge today, I think. The challenge today, you're absolutely right, is creating a new strategic plan that is going to carry your organization into the future, that is going to engage not only your entire team as it is now, but also your team of the future. And this is where I think some business people could take some lessons from great coaches. Great coaches are building the team for the future. They start scouting. They rec you, don't, you don't get a quarterback and expect them to be your star quarterback right away. No, you expect them to come in, learn for a couple years, learn under your first stringers, and then step into that. They build a leadership bench. The book that I just wrote, uh, that it just came out called Who Comes Next? Leadership Succession Planning Made Easy, talks about how you have leadership changes and shifts during times of crisis, challenges, and transitions. Sound familiar? Oh, yeah. And what, we've, what we're finding, of course, is that many organizations don't have that leadership bench built in. They think, oh gosh, you know, if we lose the CEO, we'll just hire another one. Wait a second. That's like just saying, oh, we'll just bring a new quarterback. We'll just find some kid in college who, you know, had a pretty good arm and maybe a good record, and we'll just bring them in. They're fine. They'll, they'll figure it out because, you know, all teams are mostly the same. No, they're not. They're not. And we know right now that 40% of CEOs in America only last 18 months. And we also know that they tend to be older because they have to know more. They have to know more about people and the regulations surrounding people. They have to know, about, know more about regulatory things as it pertains to their particular industry. And they have to know things like finance. So as a result, we're seeing more organizations gravitate toward more senior CEOs when they do have to replace a CEO simply because the people at the top have to know more and it's harder. And what we're finding in, and we found in the research for who comes next, and that is part of it is a psychological thing that it's that senior leader mindset that says, I'm irreplaceable, nobody can touch me, I'm so important, not so true. And this is where the military background comes in. From the day you walk into that job, you're planning to turn that job over to somebody else in two to three years. It's normal to have transition for us. And think about that, that in the military, one third to one half of your workforce is turning over every single year. And when my business people think about it, they're just like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, what that means is that we have to be constantly recreating our strategic plan, tweaking our strategic plan. We have to constantly be training. We have to constantly be, be reiterating our vision, our mission, and our goals as well as getting people who are all thrown together. Remember, we don't get to hire people. People just show up and you got to make it work as a team. And that's something that the civilian world, I think, struggles with. And that is coalescing teams fast, embracing everybody for their differences, not for their sameness, and getting people on the same page so that we all share the right values moving toward the right vision. Well, how important, in, when you're talking in that direction, how important is at the onset, vulnerability, trust, to be able to get people to uh, come into a, a mix like that? Oh, I love that question. My co-author on the book before this one, that book was called Why Leaders Fail. And, the and by the way, I think you've authored 11 books. I just, we didn't get that in the introduction. So I just want to make sure that go look for Mary's books. 
Oh, thanks so much. Um, the good ones are on Amazon. Uh, like I said, I've got, I've got piles of books out there. You know, a couple of them are good. You know, you're bound to get it right once or, once or twice. Yep. Um, I also found that I am better, and I talked to you about this before, when I collaborate with other people. Is it frustrating? Yes. Does it take longer? Yes. But the product is better. Yes. So in the Why Leaders Fail book that I co-authored with Peter Stark, we interviewed 100,000 employees. And we basically asked questions in different ways, but hey, what makes you crazy at work? What does your boss or your supervisor or your leadership do that stops you from being as productive as you should be? Why are you not more productive at work? What do you wish you could do? What's holding you back? And then we taxonomized all of those answers. We, and then those seven areas were those things we went back to their leaders with and said, hey, um, do you guys have problems with, and girls, of course, do you guys, uh, gals, have problems with these seven areas? And by and large, leadership went, nope, 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 we're good. We got this. And that's when we knew we had this delta. So that's the seven prescriptions for leadership success. Chapter two is our most popular chapter, and you nailed it. It's on trust. And it, is, it talks about ways leaders and supervisors and managers inadvertently lose the trust of their people, and they don't even realize they're doing it. It's little things. It's not fully communicating. It is playing the I got a secret game, even though you don't have a secret. It is not letting people know what you're thinking, when you're thinking, and even where you are. It's not being available. It's gossiping. It is uh, the sense that, oh, there's, there's one group that I'm working with right now. And they said, well, we don't want our employees to have to worry about that. And I said, look, they can handle bad news. What they can't handle is not knowing and the uncertainty of whether or not you're hiding stuff from them. Yeah. Now, there's uncertainty, be some, uncertainty is huge. Uncertainty is a killer. And I'm like, you know what? You hired smart people. You hired good people. They can handle uncertainty. I mean, they, they can handle bad news. They can't handle the uncertainty because uncertainty makes them unproductive. And then they're wandering around trying to get information. Well, what's going to happen? What's going to mm -hmm. happen? Did you hear anything? Did you hear anything? I'm working with a company right now that um, is having some pretty significant layoffs. And partly they're doing, they have to do this because they were not doing very well before all this happened. And they need to revamp things. And because they've never had to do this, they are really struggling. I've got a manager who has over 500 people working for him, and he has never fired one person. He doesn't even know how. So these people are really struggling with the tough leadership decisions that are the right decisions, but they've never had to do it before. This is a time for leaders to step up. And this is why this whole idea of remote working, guess what? You've all of a sudden, it's a great equalizer. All of a sudden, yeah. you find out That's who's it. stepping up, who's managing things, who's leading things, and who's just sitting around being status quo. Now is a time when true leaders are stepping up. And that, that's so true. I had a uh, client years ago when I was in a previous industry and he was in sales and he, he literally would take a, a old fashioned pin and put it there because he hated uncertainty. Uh, so he could handle the yes, he could handle the no. So he couldn't handle, well, I need to think about it. So right. he actually created a little button that said, decisions are good, make one. Right. And <laughs> gave it to the clients. Right. Um, my parents used to say, do something, even if it's wrong, just do something. Mm -hmm. Because we were encouraged as kids to kind of take risks, you know, just do something, go outside and play, go play in the street, whatever. Go take risks, go do something. You don't just get to sit around and moan and complain, make a decision. Now, one of my army bosses, best boss I ever had, I, I can say this was probably this army general. He was amazing. And he, people used to say, well, but we don't have all this information. He's like, look, give me what you got right now because we're never gonna have 100% information, but we will need a decision. So you got to make the best decision based on what you got at the time. You may have to tweak it later, but you got to make a decision. And then you got to own up to the decision. And he was the one who taught me it's okay Ownership. to be wrong. You got, you own it though. You're yeah. like, you know what? I made this decision and I think it was wrong. Um, you've all told me we maybe think this, 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 and I think you're probably right. And now we're going to do this. Your mm -hmm. team will respect you more than holding on to a bad decision. And then you defending it and it brings down the company. Yeah. Now, uh, ownership is key. I mean, I, my, I use an acronym for my business and the O in rock is take ownership for everything. That's We've right. absolutely got to take the ownership. So, and so, you know, we don't have but a couple of minutes left because I try to keep the, uh, the teamwork advantage to about 30 minutes in length because it's so overwhelming and you've got so much information. Two thoughts I want to kind of go with here, though. What are leaders missing today? What are they missing? 
leaders right now are missing the fact that they need to pivot and that people are watching them. Um, and so I use pivot as an acronym. So pivot is, of course, your people need a purpose. They need a reason each and every day to show up to work and get excited about working for you. The I is use your inspiration and influence for good. Help your people get over this. But again, you don't, you don't have to babysit them. You just got to help them. The V is assessing the volatility. Your people, and the way I do that is, it's a very different question for me to say, hey, based on a scale of one to 10, with one being pretty bad and 10 being amazingly fantastic, where are you with everything going on in our company right now? If they say a two, your reaction is very different than if they say a nine and a half. Yeah. So you've got to assess people's volatility. And again, it may not be the work conditions. It may be the fact that in January, they and their spouse and their six children moved into a tiny house, which at 400 square feet sounded like a great idea in January. And now three months into hibernation is a horrible idea. Yeah. So again, you have to assess your people where they are. And leadership is individual. You have to lead based on where they are, not where you are. It's not about you. And that O, of course, is the opportunity. Look for the opportunities. Does this mean taking advantage of a terrible pandemic? I'm not saying that. What I am saying, this is a terrible situation. And if all we do is sit around and complain about the situation, it doesn't help us. It doesn't help our people. It doesn't help our communities. And it certainly doesn't help the customers we serve. So look for opportunities to serve and to lead. And then the T is make sure you've got the tools, training, and technology in place to help your people and your business move forward. Pivot. That's, that's so critical in there. And I'm glad you clarified the opportunity not being something to take advantage of. If you were to talk to a young person out of college in his or her first position, what advice would you give that person today moving forward, considering the times that we're in, moving towards the leadership and strengthening a team? So first, when I was in my 20s, I would go to the gym three times a week to get stronger. And now that I'm several decades past that, I go to the gym five days a week to stay the same. That when you're in your 20s, you have such an opportunity for growth. Take it. Find the opportunities that are hard and work toward difficult situations. Put yourself deliberately in places that's gonna stretch you right. and in places where you can learn. Learn as much as you can from as many people as you can. Soak up the knowledge, soak up the experience, and don't be afraid to say yes to something that's really scary in your business. Take the risk, move to, to Switzerland and work for a year. Um, you know, Join the Peace Corps, do something crazy while you have the opportunity because as you get later, in your life and you've got more responsibilities, it becomes tougher and yes. riskier. So in your 20s is such a marvelous opportunity. The second part of that is work. Work like, work like you are homeless living under a bridge. Work like your life depends on it because it kind of does. The decisions you make in your younger years will carry with you the rest of your life. So make good decisions and work really hard. And third, be smart, read. Um, attend conferences, watch things that are things that don't necessarily align with how you grew up or what you were led to believe, explore ideas, learn about other people's ideas, but be smart about it and make decisions in those realms based on facts. In order to make good decisions, you have to know the facts. And that means all parts of the discussion, not just the part that you're comfortable with or that you were raised with or that your teachers think is the right thing. Look hard and find the facts Make good decisions based on facts, not on feelings, assumptions, or rumors. So that would be my three pieces of advice to young people. Awesome. One last question, and you've alluded to this a little bit already. What can business leaders today learn from military successes and military failures in the past as it relates to business today? So military leaders do the same thing as my little league coaches do. You don't always get to choose. You don't get to draft. You just got to work with what you got. My winning coaches, like my winning, and by, by winning, I mean my most effective military leaders, it didn't matter who you gave them. It didn't matter what the talent pool was. It didn't matter their skill sets. They always were that, that leader, that coach that took that team to the championship game. And every single year, it was a different group of people. And every single year, it was the same coach in that championship game. Same with my military leaders. My great military leaders could take any pool of talent and turn it into a team. And that's where a lot of civilian leaders, 
I think struggle. And they right. said, well, if I just had a better um, COO, or if I just had a better, you know, CFO, or if I just had, I mean, they make excuses for why their teams are not productive. Stop with the excuses. Your job as a leader is leadership. So make it happen. Get your people together, figure it out, take advantage of their strengths, support the weaknesses, push everybody to be their best. And that's so critical is, is push, pull, get them to be successful. Mary, this has been a jam-packed uh, 35 minutes or so on here, and I'm so happy. It's a privilege to get to know you and work with you a little bit. Her books are all over the place. Your website is there. I, I encourage you to pick up more information about Mary Kelly, and uh, be sure to share the teamwork advantage with everybody that you come in contact with. We're excited to help you make your teams better, both in teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Until next time, be sure to make it a great day because a good day is only being average. Take care. You've been listening to the Teamwork Advantage with Greg Gregory. Be sure to like, subscribe, and activate the bell icon to be notified of future episodes. To learn more about how Greg can help your organization develop a powerful winning culture, visit teamsrock.com. That's teamsrock.com.